Well, welcome everybody to the latest installment of Apiculture Online Hive Chat with NC State. My name is David Tarpey. I'm the professor and extension apiculturist at NC State University. We're joined as always by members of our, our lab at NC State, as well as those in the uh, North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services and their apiar inspection program. Um, just wanna give a shout out to the, the newest member of that crew, Bridget Gross, just started uh, within the last 10 days or so. Um, and she's going to be in the foothills uh, territory of, of the state. And she comes to us from Nebraska, or I should say comes to us from Ohio by way of Nebraska. Um, and she's just getting her, uh, her kind of up to speed on everything. And it's a heck of a time of year to, to get up to speed. So uh, welcome, Bridget. You wanna say hi to, to everybody? So hello, everyone. Hi, it's David said, I'm Bridget. Um, just moved here from Nebraska. So I'm looking forward to get to work with everyone and meet everyone. And like you said, get up to speed with the beekeeping season out here. Well, as uh, Bridget already realizes that we have uh, in North Carolina and beyond, of course, we have a really dense population of beekeepers, really, really engaged and, you know, 80 plus chapters, county chapters within the state. And so it's just a really thriving beekeeping community and um, welcome her to it. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And... Um, before we begin with our, our four segments, um, I want to make a couple quick announcements. So the first, uh, of course, was uh, Bridget being on board. Second is really that we need your help. Um, that now that kind of the spring is here and the, and the summer season is upon us, or at least the active season is upon us, we're gonna be conducting some experiments this year dealing with drone laying queens. And as a result, uh, we need your drone laying queens if you find any. Um, because when you don't want drone laying queens, they crop up all over the place. But when you do want them, they're nowhere to be found, right? Murphy's Law of Beekeeping. And so if you see a queen that has a brood pattern where 90 plus percent of the brood in the area of the brood nest that is supposed to be workers kind of in the center of the brood nest but instead of um, worker brood that's flush with the comb you see these domed up cells that are clearly drone cells rather than uh, worker cells please contact us uh, and the the person who's spearheading this with Jennifer Keller of course is Brad Metz uh, he's a research associate within our program and you can reach him at this email here, honeybeequeenclinic, all one word, at ncsu.edu. Uh, and so email, ideally with a picture of the brood so that we can kind of walk through and verify that it really is a drone layer. And then we'll talk about the logistics of trying to get that queen to us, if at all possible, rather than just replacing her and, and getting rid of her, which you probably would be doing anyway. So. If you have um, kind of failing queens or these drone laying queens, please reach out to us because we're going to be doing some studies because we have some evidence to suggest that this actually may be a recoverable condition, believe it or not, that this is not a um, uh, perhaps a permanent uh, issue with the queen. And so we're going to be uh, testing that this summer. One other final quick announcement I'd like to make uh, on behalf of the NCSBA is that tomorrow night they're going to have their third of three weekly webinars in lieu of their spring meeting. And the guest speaker tomorrow night is going to be Mike Palmer from uh, Vermont, who's a, a very famous and very successful queen producer and um, kind of he overwinters nukes in, in Vermont where they have, you know, nine months of winter kind of thing. And uh, and so he's a really popular speaker and it's really great for them to, to have him. So if you're a member of the NCSBA, check your email to make sure that you can get the, the Zoom link and be able to catch that tomorrow night at seven. It's at seven tomorrow, is that as well, tomorrow night? I think it's seven o'clock, correct me if I'm wrong there. So um, 
So then uh, to get started, the first segment that we always start with in Apiculture Online is talking about the bees in season. And so really this is in essence what your bees are doing right now, what their biology kind of dictates right now, and then what you should be doing as a beekeeper to help them and to compensate uh, for, um, for what they're doing. And so, you know, right now, end of March, getting into April, um, the spring buildup is, or at least should be, really at its height. Right now, the queen is laying that kind of maximum 1,500 to 2,000 eggs a day, about her body weight in egg mass every single day, and they are just exploding in their, in their worker population. However, because they haven't had a whole lot of brood cycles so far this year, the brood nest is kind of at its maximum and really expanding, but the adult population might not be uh, as big right now as it will be in, in a couple weeks. And so the adult population is kind of stretched pretty thin. So you have a really large brood nest and perhaps not as many workers to be able to incubate and to keep all of that brood warm. And so as a result, you need to really be careful and watch for chilled brood and other kind of brood stress diseases this time of year, especially because at least here in, in the Piedmont of North Carolina, it's going to get down below freezing in the next couple nights. And so just naturally that adult population is going to cluster and try to you know, retain heat. That means the periphery of that brood nest might be left exposed and they might not be able to stay as warm as they otherwise might. And so you can get instances of chilled brood um, or stress diseases like uh, chalk brood or sack brood or some of these other things, especially in the periphery uh, where they're not gonna be able to, to stay incubated as, as much. So just be aware of that. But if you, you know, make sure that they are flanked with enough honey and you know, the, the, the hive is still relatively um, small compared to the brood nest so that they, you know, they don't have a whole lot of empty space to heat, they'll still be able to make it through these colder nights as the colony continues to expand. Now, of course, the flip side of that is that as the colonies are expanding, and this is really kind of the theme tonight, which is as a colony is expanding, if it expands too much, the bees' natural tendency is to swarm. And so one thing that you need to be keeping out your eye out for, for the, in the next uh, several weeks or months is swarms, not only of your own colonies, but of others. And so just quickly, we'll kind of go over how to hive up a swarm if one of your colonies uh, happens to swarm. The next segment in the timely topic, we're gonna to talk about kind of swarm prevention and how to you know, avoid this. But if there is a swarm, we've already been getting some swarm calls, although perhaps not as many as we have had this by this time of year in the past. Um, the first thing to do is make sure that you link up with your uh, local cooperative extension office or your, and or your local uh, bee club. And if possible, get on their swarm call list. So a lot of times, you know, people have a swarm in, you know, in their yard or something like that. They do a quick Google search. The first thing that one of the first things that comes up is the local beekeeping club. There's a con a lot of the clubs have a contact information of who to call in case they have a swarm. And then there's kind of a phone tree uh, system that a lot of them have depending on where in the county that they're located where beekeepers can be contacted very, very quickly because you need to get there really, really fast. This temporary bivouac situation of a swarm dangling in a tree, uh, they're actively debating about what, what kind of new nest site they're gonna go to. And that can last for hours or sometimes days, but usually they don't stick around for much more than a day or two. And so the sooner you can get there, the sooner you can get these free bees. This is a hundred bucks sitting in a tree, right? So um, beekeepers really want to be able to get there and to hive up a swarm. When you do, make sure that you have your safety gear. Make sure that you bring some sort of empty nuke or hive body or something 
ideally that has uh, the entrance screened off so that as you dump the bees into that box, they're not gonna be able to just pour out while you're transporting them back. And it's also very helpful to have a bee brush or something to be able to kind of brush all the bees off of the foliage or the tree limb or wherever they happen to be because um, you might not be able to, to get them all in, in one unit. Um, so I really wanna stress this, that you only wanna grab those swarms that are safely and conveniently located. Um, again, Murphy's Law of Beekeeping, if the bees are gonna swarm, they're not gonna go to this convenient tree branch that's four feet off the ground, they're gonna go to that one that's 40 feet up in the air. Don't go scaling, you know, uh, some 40 foot tall tree with a nuke in one hand and you know just don't endanger yourself or others. Um, I've heard stories of people you know looking at this tree branch 40 feet up and saying ah, I bet you I can take that limb off with a shotgun or something. Don't do anything crazy or stupid like that. Only get the ones that are really convenient. Let nature take the others that are uh, just not accessible to you. When you do kind of hive up that, that swarm, just kind of knock them into the box, make sure you can get as many in there, ideally with the queen, obviously, um, into the box, hive them up, seal them up, and then transport them back to your own apiaries. And then that's when it's a good idea to kind of give them the frames and to make sure you give them some sugar syrup, especially if they have to draw out more frames, because depending on how long that swarm has been sitting in the cluster, um, their, their honey stomachs, their, their stores that they stored up might have uh, run dry. And so it'll uh, really help them out to give them some of that energy and their resources to start building the combs and start brooding up right away. So, you know, this is the, the season to, for swarms. So make sure that if you are the recipient of swarms, um, this is the way to, to go out and to get them. If you're just starting out your new hives, I would not recommend waiting to start your first hives by waiting for a swarm to happen. Um, it's much, much easier to start um, your own colonies, you know, through, through uh, control of your own by, by buying a, a package or a, a local nuke, ideally. Now, again, a lot of the things that we do as beekeepers is to respond to what the bees are doing right now, but also projecting ahead one or two brood cycles, that is three to six weeks ahead from now to see where the colony is going and to try and predict what their needs will be, not just right now, but you know, one or two brood cycles from now. And so, you know, within the next month or so, the spring nectar and pollen flows are gonna be well underway food is going to be coming in uh, with abundance. And so you want to be able to prepare for that and to set them up for success. So giving them extra brood boxes and putting those extra honey supers on during the honey flow is going to be really, really important. Now, again, we're right at that kind of razor's edge right now where you don't want to put on these extra boxes too early because then they have all this extra, you know, space to have to heat, especially on these cold nights. But as we'll talk about in the next topic, you don't want to constrain them where they're going to start to swarm on you as well. So add the extra boxes um, at the appropriate time, depending on the weather and the, the nectar flow in your locality and how big each individual colony is. Because the nectar flow is so abundant this time of year. This is particularly a great time to draw out foundation, especially if you're using plastic foundation, which bees are a little more reluctant to, to draw out and to turn into comb versus wax foundation. Right now, there's such a demand for new comb that, that it is really downhill sledding for them to, to draw it out while the, the natural nectar flow is going on. So this is an awesome time to go into those colonies and pull out those, those old combs that are kind of dark brown to black that have been in the hives too long. Take those out, melt them down and get rid of them and replace them with some brand new frames so that they can draw them out. And then that keeps the kind of nesting material of, of the colonies a lot healthier and, and free of uh, pesticides and, and, and parasites and other things. So 
great time to rotate out your old combs this time of year too. So plan on that in the next uh, couple of weeks. Anything else anybody else would like to add on the Zoom call there? About what we should be preparing for in the next uh, uh, month or so? All right, then I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start talking on our timely topic, which uh, again is this central theme of swarm prevention. And so what we just talked about was how to hive up a swarm after they've left. And hopefully those are your neighbor's bees and not your own bees. But here we'll talk a lot about um, preventing your colonies from swarming. And this is really walking a fine line because we want to kind of maximize our colony population. We want them to build up. We want them to get big and strong, but we, the natural tendency of them to get big and strong is to split in half and to swarm. So we're kind of pushing them in one direction and then we're pushing against that same natural urge, right? So it's this fine line that we as beekeepers are always trying to walk of getting them as big and productive as possible, but without them swarming. So we wanna bring them right up to the edge, but not to cross the line. And it is much easier said than done, I think any beekeeper will, will attest to. And so really to understand swarm prevention, you need to understand what causes swarming. And so again, for many of you, this may be introductory stuff that you learned in B school or that you are learning in B school. But for those who are just beginning or this is new to you, just remember that the thing that really causes swarming, that swarming impulse is overpopulation. And more specifically, not just overpopulation, but brood nest congestion. So if the number, if the density of adult bees, as well as the density of the brood in the brood nest is such that the bees are shoulder to shoulder and they, you know, they can't move, you know, they don't have any elbow room for the adults and the queen can't find anywhere to lay because everything's been plugged up with her egg laying already. These are the things that really trigger swarming. And the reason for that in a kind of an oversimplistic way is that when the colony gets too crowded, too congested, the queen pheromone that normally inhibits the workers from raising new queen cells, it doesn't get distributed as well. So even though the queen is there, there's this perception among the workers that she's not there, or at least they don't kind of smell her pheromones at the same levels that they think that they should. And so that's kind of how the congestion starts to trigger the workers of saying, hey, we need to start making new queen cells because we don't smell our own queen and that inhibitory signal isn't there. And so once the queen cells get started, then the workers actually start putting the queen on a diet so that she can fly because she's too heavy when she's laying eggs to be able to actually take flight. So they start putting her on a diet and they make all of these preparations to then exit in a swarm once those queen cells uh, get capped over and um, are well underway in their development. So knowing that that's the trigger for swarming, what are the things that we as beekeepers can do to minimize the swarming? Well, it's to remove those triggers, right? Provide extra space. So it's not always necessarily just putting a box on top of, of the box that you have, sometimes it's, it's a little more important than that. That certainly will help by adding extra boxes, but doing other things like reversing the hive bodies and rearranging the frames that we'll talk about here in a minute, as well as taking matters into your own hands, and that is to make splits and to essence do the swarming for them. That's gonna be a topic that we're gonna talk about next time, uh, next uh, in April, that's gonna be the topic about kind of making your own queens and making splits so that you can um, reduce the swarm impulse by the bees themselves, but also then growing the number of colonies that you have and especially making up for winter losses that you may have had. So let's talk a little bit about this. Um, what is recommended right now uh, during this time of year is that you wanna be checking each one of your colonies 
once every seven to 10 days. And the reason for that is, again, it takes about seven to 10 days for a colony to start the queen rearing process and get to the point where the queen cells are capped over. So if you're checking them that regularly, then you'll be able to see if the colony is starting to go down that path and then do something about it. Um, if you're not checking them that frequently, they can start and finish the, the swarming process before you, know, before you know it. So really, you know, regular intervals of, of checking your colonies is really, really important in order to stay on top of your bees this time of year. Now, if you read in the, the literature, a lot of the books will talk about swarm cells versus supersedure cells. Um, and so which one of these two pictures, well, I guess I, we can't really pull the audience, but if somebody can check the YouTube channel, um, uh, people can comment about which of these is swarm cells versus which of these is supersedure cells. Give people a quick chance to, to answer. A lot of times in the books, what you'll see is that if a queen cell is kind of built out in the middle or the surface of the comb, then that is a supersedure or an emergency reared queen. Whereas the swarm cells tend to be on the periphery of the brood nest, especially kind of on the lower part where they're kind of dangling down from the brood nest, um, like uh, peanuts or you know hanging off of, of the brood nest. That is by no means diagnostic. So, um, you know, people will say that, that swarm cells are on the bottom and supersedure cells are in the middle, but that's not true. You see supersedure cells that are on the periphery and you see swarm cells that are in the middle too. Um, so you really need to check your colonies, not just by propping up, you know, the bottom of the box and, and looking down below. And if you don't see anything, then there are no queen cells. It's you're gonna to have to go through frame by frame and really make sure that there's no queen cells even on the surfaces. So uh, don't get lulled into complacency by just doing a quick check. If you wanna check for uh, swarm cells, you need to go through and check all of the brood frames to, to really see if, uh, if they're starting to raise any because they can be cryptic. They're not always very obvious. But with that in mind, the things then to do is to remove the swarming impulse, that is remove that congestion. So there's a lot of kind of misinformation or bad advice out there about, you know, quick and easy ways to prevent swarming. And so here are some that you should never do, things that don't work at all or very well. So one thing that beekeepers do is sometimes they'll um, clip the wings of the queen so she can't fly. And so if she can't fly, then she won't take off in a swarm. And so while it is true that she won't fly in the swarm, she doesn't know that, the workers don't know that, and they'll, they're gonna swarm out without her anyway, and then she's gonna crawl along the ground trying to keep up with this swarm and then become ant food. So clipping the queen's wings does not prevent swarming in any way. Another thing that uh, some beekeepers do is they simply put a queen excluder on the entrance or on the bottom board. And so again, what happens is that the swarm will usher out, but the queen will get stuck behind. And then the swarm will just come back in after an hour or so once they realize that they didn't join her. Um, and it doesn't stop the swarming impulse at all. If again, if you are going in every seven to 10 days, and you find those queen cells and you say, okay, well, I'm just gonna cut them down so that they're never going to swarm. Well, you can do that, but again, that doesn't remove the, the swarm impulse from the colony, the congestion. So they're just gonna build more queen cells and then you're gonna have to go in again and cut them down. So, you know, that's, uh, not, that's uh, treating the symptom but not curing the, the underlying disease or the underlying cause, right? So really the thing to do is about nest reorganization. So, you know, if you have double deeps or you have colonies that look like something like this, what you wanna do is you wanna reorganize the brood frames within that nest to kind of maximize the opportunity for the queen to lay eggs and for them not to feel congested in the brood nest or 
uh, as a worker adult population. So if you take all of the capped brood, that is the pupil brood shown here in brown, and you put that up above, what happens is that that uh, brood hatches out fairly quickly and then the queen likes to move up in the brood nest and then now she'll have space to lay. And then you put all of the open brood right here and you put that down below because again, in a couple weeks, that's gonna all get sealed over and then that'll be, you know, that's, that'll start hatching out in, in two weeks or so. So that's a way to kind of reorganize the brood nest so that it's kind of maximally allowing the population turnover of the brood so that the queen has plenty of space to lay eggs. Adding extra supers, honey supers, is a way to kind of allow the adult population to get, to get less uh, crowded and congested, which again, removes that swarming impulse. And if you really need to kind of set them back, what you can do is this, what's known as checkerboarding, which is where you can take out individual frames of brood, ideally alternating frames of brood, take those, uh, those brood frames out, brush all of the adult bees off, and then replace them with foundation. Again, recycling old combs, and uh, allowing them to dry out foundation is a great thing to do this time of year. But then that also really uh, decongests the brood nest because now you're putting in these frames that not only do they have to draw out, now it's gonna be completely empty for her to start laying eggs into. So the checkerboarding of alternating or taking out and uh, those capped brood frames and replacing them with with foundation frames is a really great way to decrease the swarming impulse. Any other tips um, from those on the call? Hey, uh, David, I just wanted to mention uh, adding a super above uh, the brood nest to relieve pressure. Yep. Um, if you add a super of foundation above a queen scooter, they, sometimes they can ignore that. So if you need to add a, and you only have foundation, maybe pull that queen scooter off and let them work up there a little bit before you put the queen scooter Yeah, on. that's a great point, Lewis. Um, we, we like to use excluders just because we're not in the honey production business, right? We're in the research business. But one thing uh, that can overcome that sometimes too, or I'd like to hear your comments on that, is actually adding um, two honey supers, um, both half foundation and half already drawn. So the, 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 uh, the honey supers that ha already have some drawn out, they're more likely to go up through the excluder into that, right? And then draw out those foundation frames. So, um, so if you already have some drawn out, that's a great way to, to lure them. But if it's not a really strong honey flow, then you're right. It's just foundations that's kind of too much work for them at this point, and they might, they might ignore it. It's a great point. So um, what I'll do now is we'll go to our, uh, our third segment where we're going to welcome our special guests of the evening. In this case today, we're very lucky to have Ramesh Sigili, who is uh, my counterpart, associate professor out in Oregon State University. So he's on the West Coast, so he's uh, three hours behind, but he's uh, very gracious to join us this evening and to um, be able to answer questions and discuss some of the things that he has going on at Oregon State. So welcome, Ramesh. Yeah, thanks, Dave. And yeah, I think it's uh, nice to at least uh, virtually meet some of your beekeepers. I don't think I have given talks to your North Carolina group anytime, so. Yeah, well, yeah. We need to, we'll need to rectify that at some point. So, <laughs> okay. but uh, for now, uh, this will do, and we really appreciate you joining us virtually. Um, you and I have known each other for, for a long time. You got your PhD and then did a postdoc at Texas A&M University uh, mm -hmm. before you got your position at, at Oregon. And a long time ago, you um, were working on things like brood pheromone and, and some of these other uh, important signaling pathways within colonies. But you've also done a lot of work on uh, nosema. You've done a lot of work on nutrition. 
you've you've really you're uh, really a jack of all trades and a master of all of them. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I know that you have some recent research on on nutrition and how that affects colony health. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, great. So, yeah, I don't know if I'm master of all, but I agree that I'm a jack of all trades now. Doing a, uh, as again, as I said, you said uh, I have an extension appointment as well. So I very closely work with our beekeepers, and uh, that's why it's very diverse. Is uh, you know very well more than me that uh, there will be a new problem every year or more than one, and so you need to address those as well. So, so that's why I think uh, I have been into more diverse uh, research here, including everything from Nozema to Varroa to nutrition. Nutrition, but nutrition is very important one that, and again, it's uh, really critical that what we are doing here. So I'll just expand a little bit on what we are doing. So, uh, so for the last seven or eight years, I would say I've been really focusing on bee nutrition, and especially for your audience, probably they are aware. Uh, I mean, honeybees have been studied for probably very well for more than hundred years. I would say at least in many aspects, even more than that, but. Honeybee nutrition is still a very understudied area, I would say, when compared to any other topics you want to think about in bees. Uh, I know we have some understanding of the macronutrients, the carbohydrates and proteins, but especially the micronutrients, we have probably very least understanding, I would say, at this time. So especially we are focusing on phytosterols, like honeybees have this need for a very specific cholesterol. It's a mouthful. It's called 24-methylene cholesterol. And that's the primary sterile for them. And they get that from pollen. There is no other way. And so we call all insects oxotrophs. They can't create their own sterile, right? We can get, so for uh, our beekeepers that are in the audience, they can start thinking of their own cholesterol, which is, again, too much is bad. Of course, it will block your arteries, but right. you still need, uh, it's very vital for your uh, cell membrane. There are so many factors. And for insects, it's a precursor of uh, uh, your molding hormones. So if your insect has to come, go from day, like you have five larval and stars. So you have to move from day one, one day or to two day or a three day, four day, five day, and then a pre-pupil, pupil stage. Each time you have to have the balance of this molding hormones. Uh, so they, so at, at least I'll make it very oversimplistic here. So there is this egg dysteron and there is this juvenile hormone. So juvenile itself tells you juvenile means it keeps you young. And then when this egg dysteroids go up, then you move to the next stage. Right. So that stage until the juvenile hormone is still at a higher level, you'll stay at the same larval stage. Then it moves to the next level. So, so again, it's an interplay of these two important hormones. Again, I'm making it very simplistic. There are other hormones involved as well. So, so what I'm uh, trying to make a case here, all these phytosterols are very critical because these are precursors for these molding hormones. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have that critical phytosterol, the 24-methylene cholesterol in our case, in our, our honeybees, then you probably are stuck in that one day old larva. And we have done some studies in cages, like flight cages, where mm -hmm. we have fed bees only with protein supplement and some get pollen. And you can see the protein supplements, I think many of our beekeepers in the audience probably have that experience. If you are in an enclosure and you're just feeding protein supplements, they're just getting protein, right? They're not getting right. other nutrients that are there in the pollen, especially the phytosterol. So you can see after sometimes you'll see the larva being cannibalized and uh, because bees do figure out that there is something wrong with this larva when there is not enough sterile available because these larval stages are not moving from day one to day two or day three. So, so that's one area we are looking at, understanding the role of phytosterols, especially 24-methylene cholesterol in honeybees. What exactly, what amounts? They are very small amounts. And we figured out it's only 0.5% of the total diet that they are eating. That's what you need. But it's still very critical because if you don't have those molting hormones, then your colony will not grow because they'll be cannibalizing. So that's fascinating. So, so you, you mentioned about kind of human cholesterol. Is there too much? Um, and and how, did, how are the bees able to kind of regulate that? Like what do they do? And then how is we as beekeepers can, can assist them in doing that? Yeah, that's a great that question. That right, that right balance. Yeah, that's a great question. And we still don't understand. Unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you. But the, again, probably I know the beekeepers that might have interest in nutrition if they have read more papers. Like uh, uh, when I was at Texas a and there is still a professor, uh, Dr. Beamer. Beamer is his last name. They have done a lot of work in grasshoppers. Mm. So that's what I sometimes laugh that 
we understand more of uh, grasshopper nutrition, but not so much of uh, honeybee nutrition, yeah. which is, again, I, there is a reason why, because these are solitary, and, like you can put a grasshopper or a caterpillar yeah. in a small vial and you can do a lot of work, but uh, because here you're looking at uh, nutrition is very complex, right? There's this uh, social stomach where there is entire colonies needs are different there is individual needs so it's not that easy to study honeybee nutrition and those are some challenges so coming back to your question of uh, uh, is there excess sterol they may maybe but i don't know how they are regulating it so i think those are some things uh, down the line maybe if possible we need to explore those uh, uh, but yeah bees can that's what the diversity of food is important right probably most of us read Again, there is not real, real conclusive evidence, but we think bees need a diversity of food, and that's why bees collect different types of pollen because it's not just one source. If they given a chance, they'll collect probably five, six different colors coming in, right? Uh, we think that's because they do not have a good understanding, or at least they can, in terms of nectar, they can figure out which one is 10% sugar, what is 20% sugar. But I don't have, have not seen any evidence that uh, bees have the ability to detect protein concentration or how much sterile is there in that pollen. So I know as probably beekeepers, there might be a way we could help. in the, And that's what we're doing. We're trying to understand, trying some basic science here to understand the sterile needs and uh, the whole idea of this grant that I'm going to talk as well, uh, uh, the USDA grant, we, it's about understanding the bee nutrition and especially uh, the pollen nutritional composition, because we know uh, there is a lot of uh, good work going on from non-profits like PAM and even Xerxes Society that is here in our uh, neck of the woods where they are trying to promote a lot of different plants that beekeepers can plant or farmers can plant for bees. But again, the, the only concern I have there is it's all about attractiveness, right? They're, they're, they're suggesting these based on if there is lavender patch in your backyard, you'll see only bees coming to lavender. That doesn't mean lavender is the best source. Right. So there is no scientific evidence at this point. It's not about based on science, right? This is all about based on uh, of attractiveness evidence that we have. So what our goal here with this grant is if we are looking for pollen nutritional composition. So I know I'm not discounting the, the nectar part or the honey part, which is a right. carbohydrate, but I'm focusing more on pollen at this point. So, right. so we want to create this nutritional composition database for at least 100 species of pollen, uh, especially that bees visit, not, not right. the ones that they don't care. Right. I don't think I'll go into some that are not really important for bees, but we want to, have, so we have a list. And so that's very ambitious. And that's what we are all even asking citizen science help. Even your North Carolina beekeepers, I would encourage them if they can uh, get some pollen hand collected for some species. It's a painful one, but we're trying to make a two minute video, which will send how to collect pollen. Uh, and then maybe sometimes they can just watch the same bee. If you think the bee has collected pollen from just that one species, if they have visited 10 flowers and you can capture in a while mm -hmm. and you can send those pollen loads to us, then we can determine if it's 90% uh, of that one source, mm -hmm. then we can look for a composition. So again, it's a very, very ambitious project at this yeah. time. Uh, so, so, so yeah, I don't know. If but really, want... really sorely needed as, as you say, you know, compared to other, like if you compare honeybees to livestock, you know, where, you know, chickens and, and cattle and, and swine, their nutrition needs, you know, they're decades ahead of us as far as what their demands are and, and what they can provide them to, to maximize their kind of growth or milk production or whatever. We're, we're just still trying to figure out the, the composition of these nutrients in pollen, right? As you just said, I mean, that's, yeah. that is mm -hmm. desperately needed, but that's a, just a one, the first step of, of a lot of other steps to come if we're really going to be able to assess a lot of that out. I mean, research has shown that um, the diversity of pollen is better than monofloral, right? But that just kind of, that makes sense. But sounds like your research, you're trying to get to the mechanism of exactly why that is. And that would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah and in some cases, I know, I, I don't agree that we need 100 different pollens for the bees, but maybe there are only five or six that can do the magic, right? They may right. be, they may compose of all the amino acids you need and they, they all have phytosterols. They have amino, uh, sorry, the protein content that you need. And I think, yeah, that's a goal. But uh, right now, uh, my concern is, uh, th th there is no scientific way that is being used to 
promote these plants that beekeepers or farmers have to plant. Right. It's it's purely based on attractiveness. If this is attractive, just plant this thing. Yep. But yep. Uh, so yeah, it's I, that's what my goal is to have something in the future in the next five years, a better understanding of this uh, uh, pollen at least, and then we can give some recommendations for anyone from beekeepers to conservation groups or anyone that is interested in promoting bee habitat. Well, you know, one con- one thing that I've always contended, no no empirical data behind it, just anecdotal evidence of um, a lot of crops that used to be really good nectar and or pollen sources. Um, uh, buckwheat is a great example of it. You used to find buckwheat honey, you know, that really dark, you know, molasses like mm-hmm. stuff all over the place. And buckwheat, you know, was prolific in, in making lots of nectar. And it's harder and harder to find buckwheat honey. And it's harder for people to make a buckwheat honey crop off of acres of buckwheat. And I think a lot of that could be because the plant breeders are breeding for root stock and disease resistance and drought tolerance and all of these other things. And that has to come at a physiological cost. Something has to be given up in order to benefit. Yes. And one of the mm-hmm. things that could be sacrificed mm-hmm. is good quality pollen and nectar, right? So Absolutely. You know, it's very yeah. possible that even in agricultural settings, that the nutrition is being deprived mm-hmm. from our bees mm-hmm. um, because of yeah. these other things. Yeah. So yeah, that's an excellent point you make. So, well, so I'll quickly give you an example here. Um, no, that's an excellent point. That's what I, I keep talking to plant breeders as well here because so I work with a crop here in uh, Oregon. So I am in the valley. It's called Willamette Valley. And mm-hmm. uh, it's a very fertile land here. Uh, but across the mountains, the Cascades, uh, there is central Oregon and they grow about five to 6,000 acres of hybrid carrot seed. Mm-hmm. And that's a good example of what you're saying. So so we have tried to quantify the nectar and pollen uh, and the protein and the other sterols in that pollen. And, and it's it's one of the worst sources, I would say, for bees. And bees don't do well. And these beekeepers, yeah. they complain. And that's what one of my big projects is in Central Oregon, where we have been promoting to at least feed two pounds of protein supplement so that the bees, uh, bee, the bee population doesn't decline to the levels where, right. because that's the last crop they pollinate. And after that, it's a disaster if the colonies are in good shape because they can't take those hives to almonds. So, so it's a, it's a pretty, so I talked to these carrot seed uh, breeders and I said, where is, where is the bee attractiveness, at least the nectar and pollen in your list? And it's somewhere down like number eight or number nine. The first thing is yield, uh, disease resistant, yeah. pest resistance and all. Yeah. So, so yeah, so it, especially the hybrids I'm talking about where the hybrids have really messed up uh, the nectar and pollen concentrations yeah. for bees. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's great that, that that's being investigated. And I think there's a lot more work to be done and I applaud you for, for doing it. But that's also just one of the many things that you have going on. I also know that you're doing um, some work on uh, varroa mite control and especially with oxalic acid and the, the vaporization methods of controlling mm-hmm. mites. So tell us a little bit how it's, how it's different uh, your way versus down our way. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure I think uh, your beekeepers in uh, North Carolina probably use the vaporization as well. Um, and I know dribble method has been very popular for years. People have been, even before the registration came for oxalic uh, acid a few years ago, people have been using wood bleach or whatever in a more off-label way uh, to dribble in their hives to get control for varroa mites, especially. So that's what common here in the Pacific Northwest as well. We used to even our OSU hives for the last five years, we have still dribbled in uh, November, December uh, to get rid of those sporadic mites. But uh, since the vapor method came, I think there is a, a large interest in increasing uh, this vaporization even in spring and even when the brood is there, uh, which is concerning, I know, we, because we need to, any acid, like formic acid probably is a good example. You will get a huge mortality of larva if you're using two pads of formic acid. And we have done some work with formic acid as well uh, with the new product. And before that, uh, might have a quick strips, they make US as well. So, so with, uh, with the Oxalic, uh, there is a new label that is going to come. I'm not sure when, but I think the uh, USDA has been saying it might be in the next uh, two or three weeks. So the new label will allow the vaporization method to be used around the year. Uh, but I'm not sure where the data for larval toxicity they have generated, or maybe someone has to uh, come with the hard way, say, complain that this is happening, and then they may use that as a 
supplementary information to change the label again, but at least at this point, but I know that Canadian, uh, whatever they call Canadian Honey Council or someone who is in charge of uh, uh, the, the label for oxalic, they are not changing the label. They still think there is a concern about larval toxicity. So they are not allowing, yeah. Yeah, but but in the U.S., I think the next couple of weeks you'll see a new label that will be allowed to uh, allowed for use of oxalic around the year. So, so we did some studies uh, looking at larval toxicity. So uh, we did. Uh, so it's a very meticulous way. So what you do is, so we followed the label. So I know uh, we have to follow the label that for research, at least for the ones that we are doing. So, so right now the dose is one gram per box, right? One gram per box or per chamber. Uh, so if you have two story hive, then you're using two grams of oxalic. So you you take the wand and I know there is a lot of variation in that too. Uh, companies are selling those wands, the heat devices. Uh, the, there are so many prototypes I've seen. So we use the one that Man Lake sells and it's the most popular. I think it's called Varox, V-A-R-R-O-X. Okay. That's the spelling for it. So, so we, uh, and then we use a spacer. So at the bottom, because I know some people have seen, they put the wand in and they have burnt the bottom, the, the, the base, base of the frames, the bottom of the frames, because it's so close and it gets to a solid high temperature. So sometimes I've seen some hazards with the fire coming into those hives as well. Yeah, so we used a spacer. So I think I would suggest for your beekeepers as well, if they're having an, in, an interest in using the oxalic, please use a spacer on the bottom. So your top first box is sitting on the spacer and then your wand goes, then you're creating a little airflow there, right? So it, it helps your oxalic vapors go and spread evenly as well. Again, there is another study we want to do to see what's going on exactly during the spread. So we're trying to create a glass chamber and then trying to put the frames in there. So that will be this year because okay. I still am concerned about the, the physical properties, the chemistry of how this is vaporizing inside. And uh, because some beekeepers think uh, the dose is low, so they're increasing their dose on their own without following yeah. the label. So so it could be a disaster for the bees. Uh, so, so we looked at larval toxicity. So we have seen the two-day-old larva. So we pick two-day-old larva. So what we do is we take a frame so we put those acetate sheets, the transparent sheets, and we mark 50 larvae of each age group. Right. And then they go back into the hive and then you vaporize. And then every day we remove those and then match with the acetate sheet. Uh, right, right. And then we watch, okay, there was a larva here, two day old, now it's missing. So we did like very, very precise measurements of those. Right. So it looks like the two day old larva are more, so we picked two different age groups, two day and four day. We could have okay. done all, but Right. just because of the convenience. So so it looks like the younger larva are more susceptible to oxalic than the older one. Yeah. Uh, so again, it's an ongoing uh, uh, study. So we'll be repeating that this year. So we see some toxicity for sure with the one gram. But if, uh, if someone is increasing the dose like to two grams per box or four grams, so there is a University of Florida study I just saw like a month ago where they have shown uh, four grams is giving a better result than the one gram. So at least that study suggests that there should be an increase in dose. For mite control, right? For mite that, control. The, the trade-off then is that you might be burning your brood a lot more, right? So there's yeah, no, yeah. There's no free lunch here. Yeah, so yeah. So that's a part we don't understand and we still need. And I, I don't think EPA or USDA have uh, given much thought to that at this point. I don't think they have enough solid evidence that it's uh, mm. uh, the larval toxicity is not an issue. Uh, so I think at least studies like what we are doing or some others may be doing at the same time, yeah. that might help in the next year or so to get more precise information on uh, larval mortality. I think that's more, and even the bees, and sometimes bees could be impacted as well, right? The adults could be impacted in some sure. way, maybe, yeah, maybe there is uh, there is some mortality there as well. Like we don't see any dead bees immediately, but who knows uh, if the physiology changes or who knows what may, even the queens, queens may be more susceptible yeah. too to oxalic. So we don't know all those things at this point. So that's an ongoing study. I don't know if you need more information on that. Or... No, I'd like to get some of the other thoughts. So we're in the last uh, uh, 10 or 12 minutes here, we're just going to kind of slowly open it up to questions. So those of you who are on our YouTube channel, please feel free to, to type in your questions. I see that there already are some, uh, but we can go ahead and, and start with this topic of the oxalic and especially the, the new label change. I'd like to get our colleagues from the Department of Agriculture here in North Carolina to perhaps comment on that and, and how they're seeing their regulatory mandate uh, and how they see that label change here in the, in the Southeast. 
with some concern. <laughs> yeah, for the same reasons that Ramesh was just saying, Don? Or, uh, uh, well, yeah, a lot of people are just jumping on the bandwagon without uh, thinking about anything but knocking mics down off the off the adult bees. Yep. You know. Yeah, and especially because, and and it it actually is concerning to me too because the best evidence that I've seen in the, in the literature on the efficacy of that for mite control is that it really only works when there's no brood in the colony. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, or at least it works really best when it does. And so, you know, you don't want to be constantly fogging your colonies, right. um, you know, with this stuff because of all of these potential downsides, not to mention the potential harm to the beekeeper or setting your hives on fire as Ramesh was just alluding to. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, it would be nice. Do you know if any of the larval toxicity data had gone into that label change, Don? Or um, do you know what? Uh, the... I didn't see anything along okay. that line. Yeah. Well, it is an ongoing thing, but I think it is one of those things to, you know, to definitely be, be cautious and, and beware. Um, other questions that, that folks might have for Ramesh? There's, there's one here um, on the YouTube chat about asking if it could be, if you could manipulate your colonies so that you move the larvae to save it from the toxic fumes during an oxalic treatment and then put it back. Is that um, a possibility for, for beekeepers? Is that uh, realistic, Ramesh? Um, I don't think so. And again, you have to think about, right? So the mites are where? Mostly in the frames where the brood is, right? So... So if you're removing, it's not how, I mean, unless you're brushing up the bees, maybe, yeah, but I don't know if you remove yeah. the, literally the frame of larva, then you're moving all the nurse bees along and uh, the mites yeah. mostly are there. So, yeah. so it's kind of, I mean, I know it looks like a good strategy, but again, I haven't done that. So I, I don't know if I would recommend that. It's, uh, it's a little tricky. Where do you put the larva? And if you're kind of like, like David was talking about chilled brood and all at this time of the year. So if you're not putting the larva in the right temperatures, if they have been ignored for 30 minutes or so, they are sensitive, right? So they have, be, they have to be fed at a certain amount of times as well. So, so who knows, the larval development might be compromised if you're putting them away a little bit and then doing this. So, so yeah, again, uh, I haven't given much thought, so I can't be very helpful here, but, uh, yeah. but there are some pluses and minuses here to think about as exactly. well. There's another uh, good question here about the oxalic uh, and vaporization is how long after hiving a package or a swarm to go back to <laughs> earlier segments, um, would you recommend before using oxalic vapor to knock down the mites? Uh, can you say that again, uh, Dave? So how, how long uh, after you hive up a package uh, into a hive before you would want to um, uh, expose them to oxalic acid vapor. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, the earlier the better because you don't want to expose your larva because there is not real good conclusive data at this time. So I would say less the brood, you're, you're better off. And most of the mites that are there will be foretic. And that's what your goal is, right? To get rid of those foretic mites. Oxalic vapors, I don't think they will penetrate your brood and uh, get any control like Formic or some other products claim. So. Yeah. The, the original label does have a a a, a, a methodology for, for packages. For packages, yep. But it's not the vapor, if I recall. No, correctly. it's a drill. It, yep. Basically, it's a, it's a spray. Spray, spray, I think, yeah. Yep. Yeah, because um, the, the, the dosing, as you were saying before, Ramesh, the dosing is really, really critical. And in the package form, that's... that's uh, very concentrated, you know, right on them. So I, I've, I've heard of beekeepers just killing off entire packages because they vaporized rather than use the, the spray. Um, so, but after hiving them and, and then when to use it, I guess that, that was the question. Um, there's another good question here about uh, oxalic, um, using oxalic when there's a lot of capped brood and whether that might increase resistance, I presume within the mites um, 
to oxalic acid. There, to my knowledge, there hasn't been any uh, demonstrated resistance to oxalic acid. Is that correct uh, among the mites? Yeah, because I think even for formic and any organic acids we use, I think uh, because uh, the first thing we don't understand the mode of action, right? For yeah, yeah. for oxalic, the mode of action is not known. Uh, for formic, we don't know, except for the synthetics we have like APR or those are, we know the target. Uh, but these ones, we don't know. Maybe there are multiple mode of actions here, then probably, but I know there is some news, some beekeepers call me and say, oh, looks like someone is saying, uh, there will be no resistance to oxalic acid, even if we use 10 times a year or throughout the year or whatever. Uh, I don't believe that. I mean, all insects are prone to resistance development at some point. It may not come tomorrow, but down the line, it will come if you're continuously using the same product for several times in a year and several years in a row. So, yeah, uh, so yeah I, I, I don't think uh, they, they are immune to resistance, but it's maybe a matter of time. Like even with Amitra as the APR we have, we are lucky that it still works, even though it has been right. used off-label by commercial industry for a long time. Right. Uh, maybe there is something to that. Maybe it degrades faster. I think any chemical that degrades faster probably will not get resistance that sooner. So, but again, it, they're not immune to getting resistance. Yeah. Well, and it has been showing and, and propping up. So it certainly exists Yeah. Um, among those other things. So yeah, I, IPM integrated pest management rules apply. Rotating and trying different things um, can keep uh, keep these uh, pests mites from evolving resistance. Um, there's another really good question I saw in here. Oh yeah, there it is. Um, to to go back to some of your nutrition work, and this is something that that I've actually heard conflicting um, answers to. Does freezing collecting po collected pollen affect the quality of the pollen? The yeah, question. yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Yeah, we want to do some of those. I know we have been doing too many things, so I didn't find time to do that. But at least I have seen some papers or at least talked to some other people who are doing so. So it looks like, yeah, freezing will uh, keep, I, I'm not saying it will be exactly the same composition after a year. But people have shown at least the degradation of protein and some other nutrients is not that much. So, yeah, as long as you have collected it today and then within the next day or so it goes into the freezer, I think uh, it's still you can depend on the quality of that pollen. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's good to know because um, a lot of, uh, you know, the pollen flows often, you know, are very early and we don't really have, at least in the Piedmont here in North Carolina, we don't have as good of a fall pollen flow. And so it's great to trap in, in, the, in the spring when it's very bountiful and yeah. then um, use it to, to feed back in other times of the year when it may not when be less so. So it's just best to freeze it. Yeah, um, yeah. But I've always wondered about that too, because I've heard yeah. that maybe some pollens yeah. that could be affected. So. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how many of your beekeepers do that, but I have encouraged here in Oregon and Washington as well. And uh, yeah, whenever, uh, not all areas are bad. I know some of you probably don't need to do this, but, right. but where you think uh, your pollen dearth is real, especially those uh, winter bees, the diutinous bees, what we call in our scientific community, mm -hmm. the, the ones that are raised late fall, or at least in Oregon, I would say we get something between September and our Queensland until October end or even November 10th. Mm -hmm. So those are the two months when your winter bees are raised. And those are the ones that really need a good nutrition because yeah. those larval, their immunity, both, both varroa control and nutrition, both are yeah. critical. So I've been encouraging people to collect, and you don't need tons of pollen. I'm talking about if you're feeding a pound of pollen, a protein supplement, mix it like a tablespoon of pollen in there. I yeah. think that will do because the sterols I'm talking about, it's a very small concentrations you need, but it has to come from natural pollen. Yeah. You can't, there's no way you can add these sterols from somewhere else. Well, Preach, you just uh, summarized some of our uh, apiculture online webinars from last fall. So uh, thanks for reading okay. <laughs> those, those same lessons. Um, there's some other really great questions. Again, sorry, everybody, you're not going to be able to get to all of them. I'll take just one last one here. There's some uh, really good questions about uh, the swarm prevention uh, timely topic that we were talking about. And uh, there's a really good point here and something that I didn't bring up, but I'm glad that you have in your question about um, checkerboarding in the brood chamber um, right now when it's about to get you know cold again in, in the winter uh, or in, in overnights. You definitely don't want to be doing the checkerboarding right now, right? Um, you only want to do that um, 
when the the evenings are still warm enough where they're not going to need to kind of cluster. So maybe I was talking about swarm prevention, um, you know, a couple of weeks from now or a month from now where, you know, checkerboarding can really assist. That's one way of doing it, but I definitely would not uh, do that too early because then you can um, actually break up the brood nest too much and then uh, introduce uh, the brood nest of getting chilled. So that's a, it's a great point of some of the, the questions and comments um, in the chat there. But again, apologies to uh, everybody who asked questions and, and weren't able to get to those. But again, as always, these things fly by and Ramesh, I want to thank you again for joining us. Really fantastic work that you're doing out there at Oregon State. We'll try to get you down here at some point um, so that you can come and, and give us some of the results of some of the stuff that you're you're doing right there. Yeah. So thanks yeah. again. Yeah, thanks, David. Yeah. Um, and so I just want to remind everybody to uh, comment, like, and subscribe to our channel, our YouTube channel, where these uh, recordings are going to be posted. Uh, we're doing these every last Wednesday of the month. So our next Apiculture Online is going to be April 28th. And as I said before, we're going to be talking about making splits and raising your own queens to accommodate. And then our special guest uh, uh, in April is going to be Katie Lee, who's a, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Minnesota and has been involved in, in the beekeeping industry for a really, really long time and, and has done some really great work. So we'll have a discussion with her. And so until then, thank you again, everybody for attending and we'll see you next time.